The committee will come to order, and the chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Minnesota, Keith Ellison, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And also, you know, there are, there are moments in life where you just have to thank Thank God for, for being able to do what you do and being on this committee today. You haven't called the committee to address this critical subject. I, I certainly feel grateful and honored today. This is one of the high points of my service to be able to address H.R. 40 and the transatlantic slave trade and the healing of our country. Um, but I'm not going to waste time talking. I'm going to get to some questions. Uh, Professor Ogletree, many of the people who, who disagree with the um, H.R. 40 would submit that, you know, um, this slavery stuff happened a long time ago. Why don't we just move on? Uh, do you find that uh, there are other aspects of American uh, society and culture that really do focus on history all the time? Like, for example, we've, we've, we celebrate Fourth of July every year. I've never heard anybody say, well, that happened a long time ago, so let's just drop it. Um, what, what is your reaction to the folks who say or submit that it happened a long time ago, we need to be forward-looking and stop looking in the past? Congressman Ellison, a very good question and an excellent point. The reality is that the history is so important uh, if we look at it carefully. Think about slavery and think about General Sherman's Field Order 15. Uh, during the Civil War when we, lots of lives were lost, uh, black and white, uh, both from the Confederate and from the Union. Slaves and former slaves were told, we want you to fight for us for freedom, uh, and when you win this, we'll give you reparations. Very explicit, we'll give you 40 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, and that agreement was breached. We moved on. In fact, we moved on with the slave owners getting much of their property back, but the slaves not getting any of that promise. Uh, when, when you think about a constitution that still has the three-fifths clause written in it, and you think about our founding fathers owning slaves, we can't move on. It's our history. It's very important that we address it. And, and I have to applaud Bishop Shaw because the church did sit back and allow these atrocities to happen from the Holocaust through slavery. And they've recognized that you can't move on and you can't move forward without repairing the past, which I think is very important. And the final thing is that we're a nation of, of history, and our children need to understand that we've overcome our past. We're not embarrassed by it. We're not disappointed uh, alone that it happened, but we're prepared to move forward. Uh, and the reason we can't move on is because we have these sort of gotcha phrases when one of the witnesses talks about the reason we have this problem is because of the Democrats. Make it party affiliated as if that matters. There were slave owners of every uh, political persuasion. Uh, and every part uh, of our country, slave beneficiaries from New York and, and Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, all the way through the southern region. So we can't move on until we move, look back to move forward. And I'm glad that this study will do that, allow us to look back to look forward. Let me just make one final point. I mentioned my point that uh, John Hope Franklin, who chaired President uh, Clinton's uh, One America initiative in 1998, said, well, we should move on from this issue of slavery. Well. John Hope Franklin then realized that his father, Buck Colbert Franklin, was a victim of the same sort of domestic terrorism in Tulsa in 1921. And he became a plaintiff in that case. Uh, John Hope Franklin is 92 years old. Uh, how he felt when he was 50, 60, 70, or 80 is one thing. How he feels now tells us that time has made him even more aware of our need to heal, but also to look back as a historian to correct some of the errors of the uh, 18th and 19th and 17th and 20th century as we move forward in the 21st century. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, I just want to commend you, Bishop Shaw. Um, it's a tremendously courageous move by the Episcopal Church. Do you feel that um, by addressing this issue of slavery in a forthright, honest manner, that you're contributing to dividing and fracturing America? Or in your view, is this a way for us to reconcile? And I, and I just mentioned before I turn the mic to you, is that you know, I recognize that we've recognized Japanese internment and done reparations, and yet uh, Japanese Americans are as authentically and thoroughly American today as they ever have been in the history of our country, perhaps even more so, we having addressed that terrible wrong committed. Do you think that by addressing this issue, we're contributing to the fracturing of America? 
Quite the opposite. Uh, I, I think that by addressing this issue in a straightforward way, we're really uh, contributing to the healing, the spiritual healing uh, and economic healing, if that should take place, of the people of the United States. And, and I think someone who's a member of our church, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, has really shown that in South Africa, that this kind of transparency uh, leads to healing and to reconciliation. And that's, that's the kind of discussion that we want to have over you, the next year. You're referring to the Truth and Reconciliation Group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that commission uh, is dealing with issues that happened really only 20 years ago, if that, and tremendous atrocity. And yet we see South Africa, though far, far, far from where it wants to be, slowly, incrementally moving toward one society. Is that right? Yes. Mr. Clegg, um, look, can you help me understand, uh, you know, is, do, is, in, as Americans, do we still deal with and address um, historical phenomena that lingers in our present uh, day to day? For example, I tell you, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a professor of wills and trust, and he told me that he was trying to help carry out the intent of a of an individual who wrote a will in 1862, and he said it's not unusual for, to do these kinds of things. I mean, I mean, talk from, to us for a moment, if you would, about you know how how much you know recent events uh, really impact the modern world that we're in. History is. Uh, I can't hear you. Sorry. History is extremely uh, Im uh, important in understanding. The, uh, the world that we live in. And, uh, you know, as a conservative, uh, I, I certainly believe that. Uh, I'm, I'm somebody who believes that the, the meaning of a document, uh, the U.S. Constitution, uh, even though it was written a couple hundred years ago, uh, still uh, determines uh, what it's lawful for, uh, for this body to do uh, and, and, and yet, not. And excuse me, and yet you seem to be so willing to say, well, we need to look forward and just sort of like forget about that history. That no, 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 no. I, I, no, I didn't. I didn't. I, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. Um, I don't think that we should uh, forget about slavery. Uh, I think, though, that there are uh, uh, uses and abuses of history, and uh, I think that dwelling on the past and uh, looking to the past for. Uh, reasons for current uh, problems can become a distraction from addressing those problems and moving on. Mr. Clegg, let me and ask you, I think me, that Mr. Clegg, I gotta, I gotta reclaim my time now. But I just, I'm curious to know, you know, um, you know, I'm just gonna make a quick observation. Whenever I hear folks say that, well, I'm, I believe in um, a colorblind America, and I'm just for equality, and when they use that to sort of make an argument that we shouldn't address slavery, we shouldn't address historic inequality, and we just want to have, make everything equal now, I always wonder, I said, you know, I guess this person must have been a very active participant in the civil rights movement because, you know, clearly the most glaring violation of the idea of equal protection in at least the 20th history was Jim Crow. So I'm sure that you are, have a long pedigree in history in fighting for civil rights for African Americans, Latino Americans to make our society truly colorblind when in fact you know uh, our society was was not was was clearly violating those ideas of equal protection now, I don't want to ask you to call read your own resume but I, I just I will be looking forward to see if you've been consistent over the years I uh, have been I have been I can tell you um, uh, there has never been a time when I have uh, supported discrimination of any kind now, I was born in 1955 so I can't you know, claim to have been uh, there with, uh, with Dr. King, you know, in 1963 or anything like that. Uh, however, the, uh, the founder and chairman of our organization, Linda Chavez, uh, very much was uh, a part of the, uh, uh, of, of the civil rights movement. Thank you, Mr. Like, I'm going to reclaim my time now because I want to ask, um, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm having difficulty with your name. Forgive me for that. I do apologize. Ms. Tahimba. Tahimba. Ms. Tahimba, you know, I, I was a law student between 1987 and 1990, and uh, we would study contracts and property. And when we would open up our contract books, I, I knew that we would talk about 
property cases that happened way back in England and stuff like that. And we talk about modern contract and property cases. But the, thi the, the people, the, the, the America's property between 1619 and 1865 was, Amer was American slaves. And yet we never have any cases on that. And we didn't have that many cases. We didn't really explore it that in depth while uh, even after 1865. I'm just curious to know, do you really, do you agree that uh, there's just an abundance of information and analysis and scholarship on American slavery and that there's really no need for a commission? There is certainly a lot of documentation there. This is about getting out the, tree, the truth, Congressman Ellison. If we don't press the issue, then these things will not be elevated and be given the attention. They're buried right now. And it is as if uh, having a documentary that gets shown once a year, uh, that never reaches our schools, that where the issues are never addressed in our newspapers, whether uh, our, our museums adequately address these issues, then no one really knows them. And that is the importance of this. The reparations movement at its heart is about getting out the truth. Professor Ogletree, I think- Gentlemen's time is oh, well. way over. Sorry, <laughs> forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't realize. Well, neither did I. <laughs> The chair is very pleased to recognize uh, Trent Franks, the gentleman from Arizona. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, in, in listening to Mr. Ogletree's um, uh, comments in, in, the, in the beginning here, I was just so compelled by the foundation of what uh, he is motivated by, and, and I believe that that's something that I share in common with him, and I want to try to start out where the things that we believe in common, and I think you are correct beyond words that history is important. Uh, I think if there's something that can really come good from this hearing, uh, it is that we would honestly examine our history. You, you said, you know, that history repeats itself. Well, you know, there's a lot of variations to that. Someone said that uh, the only thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. And history does, in fact, repeat itself, and each time it does, the price goes up. And I, as I say, I'm just very compelled by that because I believe it is vital for any country like ours to clearly understand our past and our history. Uh, and uh, so I, I want you to know there's a strong, uh, heartfelt resonance uh, with that belief. And I guess uh, the reason I think that that applies to what are the, some of the comments I've been making here today is that the reason, the reason slavery occurred, at least in my opinion, was because people in that day lost sight of the humanity of their fellow human beings. We lost sight that all God's children are created in his image and therefore have inestimable, eternal, incalculable value. And to desecrate another human being as slavery did to millions is unconscionable and beggars my ability to describe. And it occurs to me because of something was that dramatic that we must be very, very careful to examine the cause of slavery and to make sure that we don't see those things happen again. I'm convinced that when we as human beings lose sight of our fellow human beings' humanity, whether they be unborn children, Mr. Chairman, whether they be black, Mr. Chairman, whether they be poor, whether they be Jews, whether whatever they are, if we lose sight of their humanity, I believe that we have a repeating dialogue in history uh, where, to, to name three examples, the German High Tribunal, their Supreme Court, as it were, said that the Jew was untermensch, subhuman, not a human being in the fullest sense to, to give their, their justices so-called credit. In the fullest sense, they weren't human beings in the fullest sense. And when they did that, when they robbed them of their humanity, then it was easy to kill six million of them. But we should not forget in this society that the entire Nazi Holocaust started when the medical community, the intelligentsia of Germany, decided that it was okay to kill one little retarded boy because he wasn't what everybody else thought he should be. And that is a recurring point. Not only did six million Jews die, 50 million died in this world war to try to change that, and atomic bombs fell on cities. Then comes 
things like the Dred Scott decision, or it, it, actually before that. They said that the, the black man was not a person in the fullest sense. And millions were enslaved, and it was a tragedy that beggars description. Not only were millions of God's children desecrated and raped of life and freedom, but the response to that on the rest of society's part, the Civil War killed thousands more, more than any other war in our history. Then comes along Roe versus Wade. I believe that the reason I mention this is because the, the realities are so powerful and so connected and said that the unborn child is not a person in the fullest sense and we've killed 50 million of them. And I don't know if some panel someday will say maybe we should have reparation hearings on what we've done there or what the effects will be of 50 million dead children in America. What will be the impact of America's foundations being stained by the blood of its own children? I don't know. But I will say to you that there is a recurring theme. Whenever we debase any of God's children, no matter who they are, we step into the dark. And that is why we're here today. And I believe that there could be something that could come from this that would be very good. Maybe we need a new emancipation in America to where we consider the past tragedies and see when we start to step into these darkness areas where we fail to recognize the humanity of someone and then we begin to say, well, then it's all right to do these horrible things. And Mr. Chairman, I, I want to apologize both to, well, I guess he's not here, Mr. Nadler and to Mr. Ogletree uh, regarding making uh, comparisons with pr present day parties. That's really not what I meant to do. Uh, what I meant to say was that uh, the, the I don't blame, you know, I don't think Mr. Uh, uh, the Con Mr. Conyers here should apologize for slavery. I don't think it was his fault. Uh, I don't think it was the Democratic Party's fault of today. What I am saying is that we are facing a very similar situation today and that there's a common thread among all of them. I'm not trying to elevate the unborn above any other humanity. I'm saying that there's a common thread here and that today's parties have a major disagreement. And I would say to you in the in the most sincere way to the Democratic Party. They will never be the party of children. They will never be the party of civil rights. They will never be the party that addresses the desecration of innocent humanity while they stand for killing 4,000 children a day. It can't happen. If we want to truly address the past, then we have to address our situation today. Then we will have not only the courage, but we will have the moral foundation to correct the past. And until we as a society say from now on, we're going to recognize the humanity of all God's children. The, the dreams of our founding fathers of holding the self-evident truths to be that all men are created will never be realized. And Martin Luther King's dreams, all of those things will never be realized until we say the reason that these things were wrong in the first place is because they desecrated the life of one of God's children. Now, I have one question and I'm through, and I'm sorry for getting a little uh, dramatic here. Uh, but I'm not sorry for what I've said. Um, I would like to ask you, Mr. Clegg, and then pass it along to committee, what do you think? I've already told you what I thought was the problem, what caused slavery, was that we lost sight of the humanity of a fellow human being. What do you think was the fundamental societal cause of slavery, and how can we apply that today so that we don't let things like that happen in the future in America? Well, I can't really, uh, I think, add very much to what you have already so, so eloquently said. I, I think that uh, in order to enslave someone, uh, in order to treat them as, as less than fully human, you have to convince yourself first that that person is less than fully human. And uh, I, think that that's, I think that that's what happened. Um, and as, as far as uh, applying that to to the uh, to the present day, I, I agree with you on that too. I mean, you, you know, if when you look at these very intelligent people back in the mid 1800s, and, uh, and and the fact that so many of them seem to think that this was okay, it's very humbling because you know you, you then ask yourself, well, gee, um, you know, th these were not stupid people; these were not immoral people. What what are we missing today? You know, what, what is it that people 100 years from now uh, will, will be uh, ashamed of in our history? And, and I think that you're right, that the, uh, the best candidate for that 
uh, is, the, uh, is the slaughter of the unborn. Um, you know, beyond that, I, th I, I think that uh, uh, it's also critically important that uh, we, we, we take away from, uh, from the, the, the Civil War and, and, and the Civil Rights Movement uh, the importance of, of all Americans being judged, as, as, as Dr. King said, um, uh, by the content of their, uh, of their character and not the color of their skin. Mr. Chairman, I know my time's out. Is there, if there's anyone else you would allow to address the question, great. If not, I'll yield back. Well, Professor Ogletree was originally asked the question, so let's let him respond. And I'll be very briefly, uh, very brief. Uh, Congressman Franks, the points are well taken. Um, it is a little unsettling uh, that with the passion you show for this unspeakable uh, American dilemma of uh, abortion, that you choose the uh, one and only occasion we've ever had a hearing uh, on H.R. 40. Uh, and it's important as members of Congress that you bring your issues up when you can, uh, but, but I, I think it, it seems a little odd that as passionate as you feel about those issues, that I'm not hearing the same sense about the travesties that are centuries old. Second point is this. You asked, what's the, what, what can we connect this to? What's the cause? In one word, I would say silence. When we are silent, uh, when we see tragedies and, and, and travesties, that's the greatest harm. We see it, we hear it, we observe it, but we are silent and reacting to it, whether it's uh, the Holocaust, whether it's slavery, whatever it might be. In the silence, the reason this study is so important, the silence hasn't ended. We're talking about slavery as if it's a past issue, but in Darfur and Sudan, on our watch, when we have power, at least moral persuasion, people are in slavery uh, in the world today. Uh, and so that's why I think it's important that we study this because both of our views are the same. If we fail to understand history, we're doomed to repeat it. And here's a classic example of we're repeating history because we didn't understand it uh, decades and centuries before. Mr. Chairman, may I just say that I agree with the gentleman strongly. I want him to know, just for the record, that the chairman is, is probably aware that when it comes to the human rights in other areas, specifically Darfur, because it's the one that you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I stayed up one night making sure that the Genocide Treaty got through the Senate when no one else was really trying. So I want you to know that my passion for this does go across the board. The reason that I bring this on abortion on demand up is because it's happening right now. And I feel like until we, you know, deal with and put down the knives and deal with uh, stopping the killing today, then it's hard for us to address where we've been or where we're going. But I want you to know I do truly uh, agree with you that that passion should not be singled out for just one area of humanity. Thank you, sir. Congressman uh, Conyers, may I please respond very briefly? Um, Congressman Franks, I appreciate your concern about unborn children. I would also like to ask that you have that same uh, level of emotion when we address the mortality rate of African descendant children, particularly in this country. And I'd also like to say that I would, we need to reiterate that slavery took place certainly because of silence, also because of greed. We used religion to support what we did. And one thing that we have to pay close attention to right now, and I hope that you will join in this fight as well, and that is to make sure that the media is not used to demonize the people. Could I point out to uh, all here that I'm beginning to think that this is the Commission on Reparations which we're determining whether we should have or not. Uh, I, I'd like to, I've got some nominees to come before the Commission because this is precisely the discussion that is, has certainly not been held in the Congress and as I suggest, because of my continued support of this legislation, it hadn't been held officially in the government anywhere. There have been isolated speeches and there have been academic uh, participation in this, but there has never been an official government study. So uh, it is not whether you are for reparations or what kind of reparations you are for or whether you are against reparations. 
It's whether we have the discussion on reparations, which we're having here. Uh, this begins to suggest to me that we need more than one hearing. It suggests to me that it, it suggests to me that that this is a very healthy dialogue. Uh, uh, we're not hurling accusations at one another or personalizing our particular philosophy and point of view. What we're doing is holding up for e uh, examination of everyone, not just in the country, believe me, this is a, an international question, uh, what it is we should do about this. Should it be nothing? Should it be something? Uh, should it be something that no one has talked about? Uh, the collection of these views are what bring us here today to examine H.R. 40, which is not a reparations bill. It's a bill to create a commission to examine reparations. And so I'm, I'm pleased at the, the tenor of this discussion. I turn now to the chairman of the Crime Committee on Judiciary, the Honorable Bobby Scott of Virginia. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for introducing uh, your legislation. Um, people have talked about history and the distractions about it. Um, we're going to have some discussion about the history, and I want to focus the discussion on the present. Uh, and furthermore, I reiterate the point you've made. This is a study, not uh, what, whether, whether we're going to do it, what to do. Uh, this doesn't require us to do anything other than to study it. Then we can decide whether or not it's appropriate to do anything. But there, in my judgment, are some present eff effects of the reality of, of state-sanctioned slavery that are appropriate to be studied. Let me ask Professor Ogletree whether or not um, the known discrimination in, um, in mortgage rates, where African Americans pay more for a mortgage today, than others, is that if you compound that additional payment over a lifetime, does that have a present effect on a person's wealth? Congressman Scott, thank you. The answer is, of course, yes. Uh, and it reminds me of the comment that my dear friend Roger Clegg made that uh, what brings us here is the uh, phrase uh, e pluris unum, uh, out of one, out of many comes one. But my question is, well, where are we one? If you look at education, health care, employment, housing, wealth, racial profiling, mortgage rates, credit, all those things tell us that we're not one. We're well, judged to a large extent well, by a legacy that started centuries ago and continues even today. And that has a present effect. Indeed. Um, you mentioned some others. Um, insurance rates, uh, is there evidence that African Americans pay more for insurance, same insurance that others pay? Yes. Uh, car prices? Yes. If you compound this over a lifetime, all these additional payments, does that, would that amount to much money? Not millions, uh, but beyond billions. Housing discrimination, most of a person's household wealth is in the equity in their home. If um, African Americans find themselves in segregated housing opportunities, does that affect their ability to develop wealth today? Yes. Um, and is that effect worth studying? Not doing anything about it yet, but studying. Absolutely. Now, um, contracts, notwithstanding the fact that um, some are, some there's legislation, some of which has pushed the envelope so far as to be found unconstitutional, trying to get minorities federal contracts and other contracts, still it's virtually 100 percent for one-third of the population, white males, women and racial minorities representing two-thirds of the population, um, getting virtually nothing. Uh, those numbers cannot happen randomly. Uh, is um, that worth studying to ascertain whether or not that is a present effect of slavery? Yes. Um, education, you mentioned. Um, there are some areas in minority communities where the dropout rate is 50 percent. People are not getting an education. There, there were historically uh, limited opportunities to go to college. Does this affect 
I mean, in some areas, you've got it so bad, it's, you, people aren't going to college. You've got what the Children's Defense Fund calls the cradle to prison pipeline, which um, shows where we're making our investment. Is that something that should be studied? Yes. Now, if we um, study this, there, would there be options available to us uh, that the study might reveal there would be options other than cash to individuals? A large range of options, public policy, um, issues of trying to uh, ensure compliance. It's not all uh, just a question of financial uh, opportunities. And one of the biggest advantages is that what people know more, they can be healthier, they can be wealthier, they can be educated, they can have housing and jobs. I mean, there, there are non-financial advantages to people having an equal opportunity. And might some of the uh, re results of the study suggest that we ought to address poverty generally? Indeed. It was 42 years ago when President Johnson spoke at Howard University commencement. And I would urge this committee to put his speech in the record. Uh, he talked about the disparities in 1965, how bad things were and how far we've come. It's ironic from 1965 to 2007, uh, the disparities have increased instead of diminished. So poverty that we thought we addressed in the 60s uh, is as pervasive in some respects now and even more per pervasive in other respects than it was uh, 42 years ago when it was uh, a prime consideration of our government. So if we can ascertain that some poverty today is directly linked to the um, lingering effects of slavery, we might want to address all poverty, as uh, Mr. Clegg has suggested, not just that poverty directly related to slavery, but all poverty would be addressed in, uh, what a, in education generally. Would that be a, um, a possibility without focusing just on educational disparities attributable to slavery, but we may find that addressing education generally Indeed, might if we be look a good at, idea? If we look at Katrina 2005, we look at the coal miners in places like West Virginia today, we look at uh, Appalachian uh, communities, poverty, rural poverty, it's a universal concern, and I think that's something that could be encompassed uh, that will serve all of America. Uh, Congressman me, Scott, um, I, wanted, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if uh, you wanted me to respond as well. Uh, let me ask one, one other question, if I can, and then if the chairman would have. Uh, Brown v. Board of Education, uh, Professor Ogletree included the um, effects on people of state-sanctioned segregation does that um, philosophy embodied in Brown versus uh, Board of Education, is that uh, still an effect worth studying? Uh, indeed. Uh, in fact, uh, as much as we think about government roles, the reality is that much of uh, Congress uh, was resistant to goals of Brown, uh, and there was something called the Southern Manifesto in 17 Southern states that resisted it, including your home state of Virginia, which closed down the public schools to African Americans. So it's certainly worth studying because the paper trail of how people were treated on race goes far beyond what happened in 1607 or 1619. It goes into the 1960s after all the laws were passed, and it continues with measures that have been passed uh, in the 21st century as well. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Congressman Scott, all of those disparities that you listed are already being studied. Uh, they're already being uh, studied to a, uh, an extremely thorough extent. Uh, they will continue to be studied. And I'm sure that uh, in, in terms of, of causation, uh, one cause of them uh, uh, will be discrimination. There will be other causes as well. Uh, I've, I've already talked about the, the impact of illegitimacy uh, out of wedlock births on just about any social problem that you can name. It will also be the case, though, that whatever these studies uh, conclude, that the solution, the, uh, the remedy, is not going to be more discrimination, is not going to be to single out some people because of their skin color as deserving of uh, preferences or special treatment that other people don't get. I mean, let's fess up. The reason uh, for this bill uh, is, is not to do discriminate, uh, is not to do um, studies that aren't being done. I mean, 
$8 million and seven additional uh, experts is not very much to, uh, it, it's ridiculous to think that they are going to be able to make a dent in studying the, uh, the very serious and widespread problems that you've listed. The reason for this bill is to lay the groundwork for reparations. Uh, that conclusion, I think, has already been reached uh, by a lot of people. And it's a, uh, a wrong conclusion, a destructive one, a divisive one, a distraction, and one that uh, we should not be wasting our time on. Well, do you agree that some of the present uh, social pathology is directly attributable to slavery? I think yes, um, well, but I well, think that it is well, impossible every, everybody, to... Everybody doesn't agree to that. That's why we need to study to convince them, as you, you, you apparently are convinced. Look, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to convince people through this study uh, that it was or was not uh, a, that, that, that current disparities were or were, were not uh, attributable in some way to slavery. And a lot of would it has the to do with how you define. Would the gentleman for just a moment? I will uh, yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Well, you, you don't have any balance of time <laughs> left. That's a very generous uh, effort on your part. But, but Mr. Clegg, that's what we want to find out. Uh, but you can't find I'm, that out through well, this you commission. Well, can't, you can't tell us we can't find, find it out and not do it. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you say let's fess up, we're laying the groundwork for reparations, I have no idea who's going to be on the commission. And, and unless you think that the study is going to lead to a, uh, an increased support for reparations, uh, I don't know how we, how we can hold a hearing on whether we should hold a study or not. And you say, we don't need it. We already know. Well, uh, all those things that you mentioned. I didn't say that we already know. I, 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 I said that uh, well, okay. it's already being studied. Uh, all right, I'll take that back then if it'll, it'll make this conversation move more quickly. But the, the point here is that all those things that you said that Mr. Scott is, is already being studied, they are not being studied in relationship to the lingering effects of slavery. But and I would challenge, and if they are, please send me the information right away. Not that it would mean we don't need a study, but, it, but, it, but to say that these are all being studied so you don't need, you don't need to make this study. I have a, a list of studies in the Congress for which we are famous uh, about everything that goes into the atmosphere and uh, more esoteric subjects than, than you or I would care to want to read into the record. But here is a huge historical fact that Mr. Franks has made such a great uh, emphasis on and that we all agree is important. And then you say, but a study for eight million dollars, an eight million dollar study for a year isn't enough. Well, maybe we need a longer study and more money appropriated to it. Or because that's the, I, I, I can't tell you that we do or not, but you're, you're giving me a, something to think about, and that's <laughs> why we're holding the hearing. Well, Mr. Chairman, what, what I said was that all of these things are being studied all over the country by professors and think tanks and state governments and you name it. Uh, and there are a lot of lawyers out there that want to know uh, to what extent these different disparities are caused by uh, discrimination of one kind or another. And of course, this commission is not limited to the effects of slavery. It's going to, to uh, cover all kinds of discrimination. There, believe me, there, and I think you know, there is no shortage of those kinds of, 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 of studies. And uh, the, the problem is that it is almost, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting, but it is also, in a sense, impossible to look at something that's going on today and say, can I trace this to something that happened 100 years ago? Well, maybe I mean, yes, we you can. can do that, but, but, but we, there we are can't multiple dismiss causes it. For I can't reason. call a hearing and say, uh, it's impossible, and you know it. I don't know it, 
And, and besides, neither of us know what the work product of this commission is going to be, no matter if it runs for a year or two years. But the point is, we, d we didn't come here to say this is a very important subject, but let's dismiss it because there's studies out there all the time. This committee has been so busy, we haven't been able to get to Mr. Frank's most passionate issue, and it's in the jurisdiction of this committee. The Department of Justice every week gives us more work to do uh, in, in terms of getting the Department of Justice straightened out. We've got questions now about the destruction of CIA film. We have issues uh, dealing with the whole r r realm of the jurisdiction of the committee. And for, for me to say, uh, let's fess up, you know where this is all going and, and that there are studies out there. Uh, don't persuade me that to say, well, we had a hearing and one of our regular witnesses said, look, guys, you can go find this yourself. We, we want to let somebody else do it. We, we don't have time to do this, sir. Believe me. Uh, and I would enjoy uh, this, this committee studying this. But uh, I, would, I would like now to move to Steve King, if I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you'll consider nominating me for the commission should we get to that point. I would be very interested in this subject matter as well. I, I would be happy if I have any influence over who's going to be on the commission uh, to do that. I, I would, I would uh, really uh, identify you as the most influ influential individual when it comes to that. And I appreciate that consideration. I, I, I want to maybe turn a little bit of housekeeping over uh, here, uh, take care of here with Mr. Ogletree. Uh, uh, your statement that the Constitution still has a three-fifths clause in it. And uh, I turn to Article 1, Section 2, and I read, Representatives shall be apportioned according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons three-fifths of all other persons. Now, I've abbreviated that a little bit, but I think it reads in its continuity. That would be the, su the section to which you're referring? Yes. And uh, the statement that that still has the three-fifths clause in it um, but when I turn then to uh, Section 2 of uh, the 14th Amendment, and it says, Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. Um, would you agree that that has been amended out and no longer is in the Constitution? That was the purpose of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And so the Constitution then no longer really does contain in its text as its meaning today three-fifths at it because that's been amended out by the 14th Amendment second. Right. Okay, and, and I raise this point, Mr. Ogletree, because I, it concerns me that I hear that dialogue come up continually, and I believe there are people out there in America that believe that what you said in your testimony, that three-fifths is in the Constitution. Yes, it's in the text, it's in our history, and I acknowledge it's in our history, that slavery is in our history, but we no longer have slavery, and, and in the amendment, the 14th Amendment, it's out. And so would you agree with me that it's inappropriate to continue that kind of dialogue? Let, let me tell you what's inappropriate. The statement that you made was that African Americans were, th slaves were considered only three-fifths of a person. The reality is that they weren't considered persons at all. The three-fifths clause was there not for slaves to have any rights or power. It was there to have slave owners to have some proportional representation in Congress and another means. Well, so the that. idea I, that I, I agree with I, picking up on the point that uh, the good point that uh, Congressman Franks made about Dred Scott, uh, uh, you know, the, the the irony of what Chief Justice Roger Taney said in 1857, there were no rights at all. And my point is that three fifths clause always reflected the power of white slave owners. It never reflected the power of a former slave or slave to do anything is my point. I, I agree with right. your point, and I'm glad you made that point, but I want you to agree with my point that three-fifths is no longer part of this Constitution. That's exactly right. That's, thank God for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Thank you, and I'd appreciate right. it if it's not part of the dialogue that, that informs Americans that it is, it is currently in there. I think you've given the proper historical analysis right. of it in your response to my question, and right. I, thank you. I very much appreciate that. Um, and you also referenced um, the, uh, the promise of 40 acres and I don't think I tuned in quite well enough. I've always heard it as 40 acres and a mule, but who made that It says promise? 40 acres of tillable land. This is uh, General Sherman, field order number 15. 
that was designed to encourage uh, slaves and former slaves to fight mm -hmm. in the Civil War uh, on the side of the Union. Now, where is this as a document that's yes. been published? Yes. It has a signature on it, I presume. And it, it, all the, I'll, I'll give you the entire history. It's, it's well known, but I'll, I'll submit that to the committee, as well as General Johnson's um, uh, rejection of that after the war. Without objection, we'll accept those documents. Yeah, and, and I do appreciate that, and that's a piece of history that I need to sit down and read so that I'm, I'm not boring, am I, Mr. Ogletree? Um, a, a piece of the history that I, that I believe I need to have. However, is it your position before this committee that... Um, that a Civil War general can bind then um, a promise that goes uh, beyond the century and into the next century? I mean, if we're sitting here as a Congress, they can't bind the next Congress. And I believe that you're making, the, you're making the statement that that promise that was made is somehow we're obligated to follow through on that, and I'm wondering by what authority you'd make that allegation. Let me be clear what I said. General Sherman issued Field Order Number 15 on January 16, 1865, targeting respectable Negroes, heads of families, et cetera, uh, and that they would receive a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable land, et cetera. That's what he promised. And my point is that that promise was broken. That's why studying this history is important. Uh, it was never kept. And so we don't even, you didn't know this history. I know it because it's I very important. The pieces of it, I didn't right? know the details. Well, it's very, it's very clear, and those who have been involved in this effort for uh, decades have been very concerned about it. But the history is there, and there are other broken promises. So the study will allow us to have a record for the first time. Ah, we didn't know that right after uh, slavery, in the heart of slavery, there were some efforts to move forward. We didn't know that promises were made and okay. broken. So those that stepped forward and fought would be the ones that, uh, that, that you believe should deserve, their, their descendants should deserve reparations? At least. They were promised that. And, and in and fact, I mean, the reality is I mean, that if we're going to use this as a guidepost, then we'd also have to identify who the descendants are of the people who honorably stepped forward and defended? We'd like to. That's one of the problems of history, uh, Congressman King, is that, that, again, you can point to your 1800 Bible. I can't. I, I did hear your mark on right. that. I, I had him bring it over, so I, it's I, here I, and it's I, real. And I hope you treasure that. And I wish I, I could. Absolutely. I, I wish I could identify with anything, anything in the 20th century or the 19th century, or the 18th century. And you also That's, recognize. I do that know that that my uh, family didn't come from Arkansas uh, and um, uh, Alabama. They may have ended up there, but I know they came from much further than that. And so my point is that studying history helps us to appreciate this uh, and appreciate the fact that we still have a long way to go. Thank God, despite all those barriers, I am here. I have a job. I have a reputation. I have a profession. But that doesn't address the millions of people who are uh, suffering because they never received the benefits of And you also recollect that I had stated that my grandfather's artifacts were lost because he was killed right. in the Civil War. And that would be the same kind of loss of history that, that you've expressed here. Um, will, the gentleman yell, uh, the, will the gentleman yell for just a quick question? Uh, depending on how much time I might the, have. The gentleman's you? time is, is nearly extinguished. Uh, if he can uh, uh, finish up with I one question. I, I would like to uh, then just finish up, Mr. Chairman, and, and not yield it, because there's a question here that I, I think is really important uh, philosophically before this committee, and that is um, the issue of regardless of some people suffered under slavery. And some people suffered mightily to end slavery. And some of times it was the same people. Sometimes it was slaves that suffered mightily to end slavery. Sometimes it was abolitionists who came from the North who suffered mightily and gave their lives to end slavery. And I, maybe if I could compress this question down to John Brown and ask you as a panel, do you believe if reparations are to be paid that they should be paid by the family of John Brown or should they be paid to the descendants of John Brown? I'd like to start on the panel and hear the answer. <laughs> I, d I don't think we know the answer to the question. You know, I, I've been sitting here trying to listen to this uh, conversation and translate it into um, language of faith. And I, I, I think the word that I've come up with is discernment, and that it's uh, HR 40 is about, is about the issue of discernment. And the point being that uh, every human being brings part of God to a discussion. And the discussion is always important if we're going to find God's way and God's truth. And what, what, this, what this HR 40 is about is carrying on that process of discernment so that we can find out the truth of faith. 
And I think to answer your question directly, we don't know. And I think that that's what uh, Chairman Conyers is saying, that this, that this, uh, this resolution will take Thank care you, of. Thank you, Well, I would say the answer is neither. Uh, and the reason because it is not only do we not know, but in a sense it is really unknowable uh, whether the descendants of John Brown, you know, quote, deserve, end quote, or, uh, or not uh, reparations. It's impossible to tell in 2007 uh, or, or, or to speak with any kind of, of moral authority uh, about whether someone deserves more than they have because of events that happened uh, 150 years ago. It's, Thank you. It's, if I go to the there, there's, too, there's, there's too much that's happened since then that also affects where an individual is. Thank you. Gentlelady? I thank the gentleman so much. And Congressman, may, may I respond, please? Um, I think that uh, what we need to look at in terms of religious doctrine is that they normally say that the enslaver, when they release the enslaved, have a responsibility to provide something so that that uh, formerly enslaved person is capable of taking care of themselves. That was never done. What we actually saw, however, mm. was particularly in the area in Washington, D.C., that the former slave owners received reparations, but those who were enslaved received nothing. So we have to get to that. The reason for, I think, concern here when you discuss reparations is because it goes back to this discussion of a check, and it is not Could just Could you answer to the family of John Brown, though, please? I, I don't, I'm not going to respond to that. Yeah, I then, think what then we I'm need to look at the is the time uh, beyond where I've, I've already stressed my limits and I need back to the chairman. Thank to you. Formerly enslaved uh, could we get oh, Mr. Professor Ogletree? I'd be happy to response? do that. I would just thought I'd yes. stress your patience too far, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think the government should take the responsibility of responding. That's what we did with the uh, Japanese Americans in the 1988 Civil Rights Act. That's what the uh, world expected. Uh, countries to do with the uh, uh, Holocaust survivors, uh, not always finding individual uh, people responsible, but to the extent that the government was complicit, the government takes some responsibility, whether that's financial or some other means. I thank the gentleman, and uh, I, I would point out we are now beginning to work on, work up a conflict here because we have another hearing that was supposed to have begun in this committee room and uh, with another panel to go, uh, the chair will have to be a little bit more stringent in the, the generosity of the time that he has allowed thus far. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, I, I'd recognize the gentleman briefly. Uh, the um, committee, the hearing that was supposed to begin at one o'clock uh, will be delayed until the end of this hearing. So um, we'll just continue on with this hearing, and the Cram Subcommittee will begin at the end of this hearing. Well, that's very kind of the gentleman. I, I, I should be referring these things to him instead of making the decisions myself. I thank him very much for his generosity. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Steve Cohen of Memphis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does anybody on the panel feel like it was a mistake for the United States Senate to apologize for lynching? Anybody think, Mr. Clegg, you think it was a mistake to apologize for lynching when we didn't know the lynchers, the lynchees, et cetera? Well, I'm trying to remember the, the specific facts, uh, Congressman Cohen, at the time. Um, now, of course, the, the Senate was, was apologizing on behalf of itself. Is that correct? No, I think it was apologizing on behalf of the country. I don't think any senators did much lynching. There were a few people well, I, that I do have should a have been lynched, that, but then. no. I do have a problem with that, then. You yeah. do? Okay. Yeah. Do you have a problem with the United States having... And, and not because I think that, you know, there, that, that... Oh, I understand. ...lynching was not, not a horrible person, I but I think that. that in order to apologize, uh, uh, you know, for me to apologize for something, uh, it has to have been, in some sense, my fault. Otherwise, it's the nation's you know, fault. Apology. The nation permitted it to go on. The nation acts for all of us. It's the you know cumulative deal. But see, when 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 the to, to say that uh, uh, America now uh, is is going to uh, apologize for things that 
individuals did some time ago and permitted which, you know, by the government could have been stopped had the you know had the Senate been you know more aggressive but uh, I, I as I say in my testimony I, th I think I've that that kind of apology uh, is, is understood uh, unfortunately as being uh, uh, an, uh, an apology um, by some p uh, individuals because of actions done by other individuals with whom they have nothing in common except for the color of their skin. And I think that that is uh, inconsistent with the, uh, you know, with the principles that, that I was talking about earlier. How about the apology that we, that we asked the Japanese government to, 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 to give for having used comfort women in China? The House passed that unanimously. Was that a mistake? Again, I'm not I'm not familiar with the specifics. Um, All right, let's of stop it there. I've, I've, I've heard your responses. We do have a limited amount of time. Uh, was it a mistake for us to apologize to the Japanese we interred in World War II? Well, now there, uh, again, I, I assume that the, it depends on, on whose behalf the apology was. The country, the United States the nation. government did the interning. And so for the United States government to apologize, I think, uh, I think would have been appropriate. All right. In slavery, the United States government permitted slavery, made it legal, did. And while Mr. King's relatives, whoever they were, might have lost their lives in, uh, in, in the war, and, and God bless them for participating, uh, for 100 years thereafter, they made people <coughs> unequal citizens. They couldn't get the same lawyer job as you got. They couldn't get the same business job as some white person got. And for 100 years, we perpetrated, perpetuated that racism and that badge of slavery. It was a well, second-class slavery. Well, so when, you speak. when you say we, when you, when you say we. We're uh, a country. Well, you know, again, I don't think that, uh, I, don't, I don't look at it that way. Um, and I think that the way that the, that the bill is drafted, uh, it suggests that one of the things that this uh, um, Commission is supposed to think about is whether an apology on behalf of the United States government, or no, by the United States government on behalf of the American people to, and then it doesn't say to whom the apology is supposed to be made. And I think that each step of uh, each each step there uh, raises a lot of questions. The United Mr. States Pro government. Professor now, Clegg, we've got a limited amount of time. I'm going to stop you because I know where you're going, and we can get. Ann Landers or somebody to help us with who the apology should be made to. That's formalities. It's big picture. <laughs> well, I think big it's pretty important. Much important. I, Let me I, ask I, the bishop a question. Uh, Jesus was Jewish, was he not? He was. And so he would have done Passover, would he not? He would have. And at Passover, don't the, the Jews, and they still do it to this day, look back upon the time they were in bondage and reflect upon it and say we should always be against putting people in bondage and have concerns about people that were in slavery? Yes, and I think it's a, a message that's repeated by the prophets in the Hebrew Scripture over and over again. And so, you know, it's kind of a hackneyed thing, so it's a tough thing to come up with, but what do you think Jesus would think about slavery? Did he, what, what do you thought somewhere 1,865 years, 1865 years later, somebody forgot about the Passover Seder and the Passover lessons, and, and how would he have dealt with that? Part of, part of our baptismal covenant in the Episcopal Church is to respect the dignity of every human being, and that, um, that part of our covenant comes directly from the teachings of Jesus, and Jesus' uh, continual um, reminder to all of us that we should never forget, that always we should be calling from remembrance into reality. Now, I, as a Jewish person, find the Passover service to be the, my favorite holiday. It's got great eats, and it's also got a great story. And it's got the story of the Jews having been enslaved and to forever after remember and never forget about other people who were enslaved. And I think that's part of what this is about. And, you know, I, there's differences on this panel on the theory of abortion. But I find it very difficult as a Jewish person whose ancestors were killed and enslaved during the Holocaust and as a person who represents many, many, many African Americans who were enslaved and killed along the passage to America, in America as slaves, and then continually through Jim Crow kept as second-class citizens. One thing is the issue about choice in Roe v. Wade is the freedom of a woman to make a decision concerning an embryo. And the other is the decision of a powerful government to kill and take freedom away. 
One gives freedom, whether you think the person should have it or not. The other takes freedom and life away. And I think it's difficult to juxtaposition the two. You know, in the Jewish religion, which Jesus was, life wasn't considered beginning until birth because so many children were aborted naturally. And to save the, the, the woman and the, and, the, and, and the father from having the angst of the lost child, that the child wasn't considered a child in being until birth. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and finally, we turn to Daryl Issa and uh, to Sheila Jackson Lee before we're summoned for another uh, set of bells. The gentleman Mr. Chairman, from California is resting. Mr. Chairman, uh, prior to that, I, I apologize to you, uh, but at the request of the ranking member, I have to respectfully uh, re uh, object to the participation of a non-committee subcommittee member. As, uh, as far as Ms. Jackson, even though I say that in the greatest respect to the gentlelady. Well, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. Let's recognize Daryl Issa right now. He's, he's a legitimate member and entitled. Was I ever speak. considered illegitimate? Well, some members are and some members aren't. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for recognizing me. And I'm, I'm going to be brief and yield the remainder of the time to the ranking member. Uh, I, I just want to. I want to put in perspective an observation of today. I'm uh, the founding chairman or co-chairman of the Philippine Caucus, and General MacArthur promised the Filipinos that fought with us in World War II that helped push back, and most of whom died, that they would be treated as any other GI. Uh, two years later, the U.S. Congress, in the Rescission Act, voted that promise away, and it has not been kept. Uh, that is a promise in which the people promised it. The actual people who fought, the Rangers, the Scouts, they're still alive. So although I, uh, I think this is uh, certainly a, a, an interesting exercise in, in reparations talk, uh, I will tell you the Filipino community is only asking for reparations to the people accountable to that promise. And uh, I would hope that, that if we go forward with the discussion of reparations, we're truly talking about reparations uh, to the extent that somebody can be legitimately found to be the inheritor, remembering that government takes 55 percent off the tox at the top of inheritance in each generation, the inheritor of that. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that discussion does go on if this, uh, this bill goes forward and the Commission goes forward. And with that, I'd yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. Well, thank you, uh, sir, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I guess I'll just use the time here to, to try to respond to uh, a few things that have been said. First, if I could, and, and uh, forgive me, the gentlelady at the, at the I, I guess everyone's had trouble with her, her could name. Could you put your name tag in front of, of you, ma'am? Oh, it uh, fell. Oh. Well, let that, me. That's let, what's given us. Let me so just say, ma'am, I was very, very. You know, the, your 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 comments to me, I think, were entirely uh, accurate, and I agreed with every word. Now, I, I will have to sequester that particular part of your uh, your uh, statements because I, so there were some other things that I disagreed with you on. But th what you said to me, I think, is exactly right. One of the things that you said, you know, this is this is about the value of human life, past and present, and I certainly do agree with that. And um, Related to uh, uh, Mr. Cohen's comments, I, I, I guess it, it's important that he understands, you know, when he mentioned about the, the Passover, uh, I am very familiar with that uh, uh, entire um, history of, of the, the Jewish people, and I believe that that was something that is very appropriate. You know, they acknowledged what had happened to them, and they promised that not only they, were they grateful to God that they were delivered from the slavery in, in Egypt, but that they would work hard to make sure that their descendants were never enslaved again. I mean, I've been on the top of Mount Masada where they, they say that, you know, uh, Israel will never fall again. Masada will never fall again. And so I believe that it's entirely appropriate to go back in our history and acknowledge uh, some of the things uh, that have happened. But I have to, to take Mr. Clegg's uh, point of view related to the apology. The apology is something that you apologize that you've d wronged another human being. You've done something wrong, and you're apologizing to them. I can't apologize on behalf of Adolf Hitler. I can call him every name I can think of uh, and s say that he was a, a, a despicable excuse for a human being. Uh, but I can't apologize for him. Only he can do that uh, if he's anywhere where he can. Uh, 
so I guess the, the point is that I think that there might be at least something to think about, and I, I, I don't offer this as a proposal, Mr. Chairman, but as at least something to think about, that perhaps there would be uh, some common ground in all of us coming together and saying, you know, whether it was the Holocaust uh, in Germany, whether it was slavery, uh, whether it is what I believe to be a modern day Holocaust, in every case, uh, the people ask a question, or they should have, uh, was the black man a human being? And uh, our predecessors got that question very, very wrong, and it led to a tragedy that beggars description. Um, when the, the Germans, the intelligentsia of Germany, asked the question, was the Jew a human being? They got that question very wrong. Now, I would suggest to you that there was an inherent bias in that, that they deliberately came to the conclusion that they did because they felt that there was a selfish, as Ms. Tahimba mentioned, that there was a greed factor, that there was a self-serving factor in coming to that conclusion. But I think the same thing is, a, is, is true today related to abortion, that there is a self-serving factor here. And I don't mean that on the part of the woman. I, I would point to the, to the abortion industry, which is now a Fortune 500 company, or would be if it were measured in those terms, uh, in this country. And I think there might be some uh, advantage for us to come together and say, let's go back in our history and let's point out, let's look at the, the examples and recognize the examples, acknowledge them is the word, of where we failed to uphold the creed of this government that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator, given the gifts of God by their creator of life. That's the first one. Without that one, the reason I emphasize that one so much, Mr. Cohen, is without the right to live, none of the others have any meaning whatsoever. Um, and if we could go back and say that this is a place where we failed our fellow human beings. And from now on, we're going to go forward and we're not going to do that anymore. If we want to honor or repair the damage as best we can to those who suffered the Holocaust of slavery, and I do believe it was a Holocaust, uh, if we want to repair that damage, I think if we could have them here in this panel today, what they would say more than anything else is don't let it happen to anybody else. It's too late. Can't fix it for me, but you can make sure it doesn't happen to my descendants. Mm -hmm. And I think that those, those might be some common ground uh, things to, to, to follow. But once again, um, in every case, these tragedies were because we as a human family failed to recognize the human dignity of some particular group or members of that human family. And we continue to do it today. And unless we change where we're going now, we will continue down that darkening path uh, to where the survival of the fittest prevails and darkness prevails over humanity. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield I, back. I thank the gentleman. And I'm pleased now to recognize the distinguished gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Arthur Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize to Ms. Jackson Lee for getting ahead of her since I'm on the subcommittee. L let me try to make a couple of points because I do want Ms. Jackson Lee to have ample time today. Mr. Clegg, I, I want to start with you. I know a lot of the conversation, a lot of the hearing today has revolved around you, but something that you said kind of caught my attention. Uh, <clears throat> listening to you, you've had a lot to say today about, uh, if I can ask my colleagues to, you've had a lot to say today about delinking the past from the present. And I, I thought about that a little bit listening to you. Are you opposed to legacy admissions for colleges and universities? I am for public universities, yes. Are you opposed to it for the Harvards and Yales of the world? Well, I think that should be left to the Harvards and Yales of the world. Are you uh, morally opposed to it as a philosophic matter? No. I'm bothered by that. Uh, <clears throat> and Professor Ogletree, this may be something you'd want to weigh in on. Normally, sometimes you can grade people by consistency in their remarks, and sometimes people don't even bother to go through the charade of consistency. Uh, you've shown some effort to be consistent today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but the problem with that, if you're consistent about wanting to separate the link between things that happened yesterday and today, if you're consistent about the proposition that what happened to another generation shouldn't be binding or have relevance to us today, it would seem to me that a lot of your passion, a lot of your energy ought to be dedicated to the fact that you have an extra edge at getting in a Harvard or a Yale or a Princeton if your great granddad went there, particularly if your great granddad gave a lot of money. That strikes me, frankly, as being 
uh, rather inconsistent with your point of view. Uh, Mr. Ogletree, did, would, would you like to comment on that, on whether you see a tension between legacy admissions at Ivy League schools and Mr. Clegg's argument? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, not just philosophical, but a personal question, and I'll answer it from the personal point of view, uh, because uh, having gone to Stanford that has a legacy plan and Harvard uh, with that same sense of legacy, I just uh, recount the story of my daughter uh, who applied to Stanford. Uh, and got a letter saying, congratulations, uh, you are a legacy because your mother and father are graduates of Stanford. She resented that, right? Her point was, you know, are you looking at me uh, or are you looking at my parents? Now, the irony is that the reason I am sort of unwilling to get rid of legacies is this reason. We've just arrived. We've just arrived in numbers where the first generation of African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, Native Americans are graduating with children who are going to these institutions. And I bet you that as affirmative action has disappeared, legacies will be next. Because guess who's at the door? Over 50% of Stanford's entering class are students of color. So even though we're taking things away, are we taking away things that make some sense? Is it going to stop? the Packards and Hewlett's from the millions uh, for Stanford, or is it going to impact more directly the first generation or second generation of those going to these institutions? Well, let, let me just but say that's this. That's why I think the history yeah, is important. Yeah, and let me just and say this observation. Point. Regardless of what happens in the future with legacy admissions, there's been a long-standing practice of legacy admissions Absolutely. way before Charles Ogletree's daughter was a possible candidate. That's and, why history is important. Right. That's why we and, have to look back. It worked and, for everybody else, uh, right. and we shouldn't disconnect. And it worked for everybody else in a way that did not, frankly, draw a significant amount of opprobrium or a way that did not draw the kind of philosophic critique that's attached to the kind of thing that Mr. Conyers is trying to do. Right. The second observation because I want to make. Because racial discrimination is quite different than well, about any other kind of discrimination. Second observation I want to make. Well, it is racial discrimination in the sense right. that the people who are legacies are largely not people who right. are African American, Native American, uh, Latino, or, or, or Asian American. But the second not. observation, so Mr. Clegg, that I want to make. As you say, though, that's not true now. Go ahead. Second observation that I want to make has to do with a line of questions Mr. King was pursuing with you, Professor Ogletree, that dealt with the question of language and the Constitution and the value of removing it. I want to relate that for just my last seconds of time here to my state of Alabama. Twice in this decade, we've had referendum in the state of Alabama that dealt with cleansing language from the Alabama Constitution. In 2000, there was a referendum on language in the Constitution that banned marriages between black individuals and white individuals. In 2003, or 2004 rather, there was a referendum that dealt with language that uh, uh, could have been interpreted as allowing segregation in the state schools. And there was a very strong effort to remove the offensive language. A lot of people on the other side of the argument sounded a little bit like Mr. King. Their argument was, well, interracial marriage bans have not been enforceable since Loving B. Virginia. Uh, school segregation has not been the law of the land since Brown. And this argument advanced, well, why go back and feel the need to cleanse out language when the language is no longer operative? And frankly, the point that was made to them was, if a document that purports to speak to all of us if a document that purports to speak to our sense of Gentlemen's national time community. Has expired. Can I finish my sentence, Mr. Chairman? If Absolutely. A if a document that purports to speak to our sense of national community on its own terms debunks that notion and undercuts the idea of community, it's always worthy of being changed and cleansed. So, well, I didn't hear the full benefit of Mr. King's argument, so that struck me as a relevant observation. I thank, thank the you. gentleman, and uh, all time's expired. This, this panel has been uh, very, very contributive to the discussion. I thank each and every one of you. But I'm going to now call the second panel, and I would like those persons to uh, Chairman, is there any time that I could seat. be yielded? No? Oh, of course not. There's nobody here to yield you the time. Okay. Their time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome.
good to see you guys. Good to see you. Always good to see you. 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 All right. All right. Will the witnesses uh, quickly take their places? I thank the second panel. The first witness is my dear friend of the family, Joanne Watson, a University of Michigan graduate. I don't know how she figured in on the discussion be about Harvard and Princeton having these prerogatives uh, when their children go to school and apply there. but. She serves with great distinction as a member of the Detroit City Council, and she's pre presenting testimony not only in her own behalf, but on that of Ray Jenkins, uh, the, the gentleman who has pressed this member into numerous discussions about a study bill on reparations for many years. Ms. Watson, Councilwoman Watson, was a delegate to the United States Nations World Conference on Racism in Durban, South Africa. She is an active, she's president of the National Anti-Klan Network and the Center for Democratic Renewal. And prior to her service as a member of the city council, she served as public liaison for my office. We welcome you, council member Joanne Watson. Your testimony, like everyone else's, will be uh, recorded and reproduced in their entirety in the record, and you may take time to summarize your statement or make any other comments you choose. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you in a very special way and tell you how proud I am to uh, be one of your constituents and uh, to come from the uh, city of Detroit, where you have represented us with such distinction for so many years, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for being the sponsor of H.R. 40 since 1989. I am here today uh, to represent Reparations Ray Jenkins, who is uh, considered the Moses of the reparations movement in the city of Detroit, and some see him that way nationally. He has asked that I speak for him today, and he is hoping uh, that if the, the chairman and the committee, this august committee, uh, d determines to have uh, multiple hearings, he's hopeful that there might be one in Detroit where he could speak uh, personally to this august body. Uh, your role has been significant and substantive and it has given a, a great weight to the discussion that has taken forth already today. I'm also proud as a native Detroiter and a nationalist, a Pan-African, to acknowledge the, the legacy of ancestral Detroiters like Chris Austin, who first discovered archival records documenting the work of Mrs. Callie House uh, and her courageous organizing and her advocacy for reparations or pensions as she founded the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association. She was wrongfully indicted and imprisoned by this country with fraudulent claims of mail fraud, but the government's persecution did not stop her brave African warrior self from filing a class action lawsuit and on our behalf against the U.S. government on behalf of Africans who had been immorally enslaved in this country. It's important that we uh, also note that another uh, Detroit area ancestor, Reverend Milton Henry, along with his brother, uh, Dr. Mario Bedelli, formerly known as Richard Henry, brother Gaidi, 
Reverend Milton Henry, a founder of one of the founders of the Republic of New Africa in Detroit, who was counsel to Malcolm X and who recorded Malcolm X's voice. He provided a sacred spiritual sustenance regularly on the righteous righteousness of reparations using uh, Old Testament Numbers 5.5. Five. And to quote Reverend Milton Henry, when you have taken that which does not belong to you, God's law is that you return it plus a fifth thereof, unquote. Certainly the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who founded the Nation of Islam in Detroit, uh, the significance of the Shrine of the Black Madonna, founded by Jeremoji Abebe Agayman in Detroit, and people like Queen Mother Rosa Parks, who spent more years in Detroit than she spent in Montgomery, Alabama, and she was an active member of NCOBA, the reparations movement, in fact, attended a national convention. Kwame Atta, the late Kwame Atta, now an ancestor, strong supporter and fundraiser along with reparations, Ray Jenkins, all of these shoulders we stand on today. As we address the topic of reparations in the U.S., it's instructive to use uh, the Reconstruction as one of our backdrops. If we look specifically at George H. White, the last African-American Reconstruction Congressman and the last African who had been enslaved to sit in the House, Congressman White was born in Rosendale, North Carolina, was a graduate of Howard University, studied medicine, and then studied law and passed, passed the North Carolina Bar. He was elected in 1896 and re-elected in 98. He was, was able to obtain back pay for black Civil War veterans, but his colleagues refused even to hear a federal anti-lynching bill. During his last speech in January 1901, Congressman White said, this, Mr. Chairman, is perhaps our temporary farewell to the American Congress. These parting words are on behalf of an outraged, heartbroken, bruised, and bleeding, but God-fearing people full of potential force. It would be nearly 30 years before the next African-American Oscar de Priest of Chicago was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1929. If Congressman White or Callie House could offer testimony on the issue of reparations today, they would certainly attest to the fact that Africans never received 40 acres. On March 3rd, 1865, weeks before the end of the Civil War and almost a year prior to the ratification of the 13th Amendment, the Freedmen's Bureau was created by an act of Congress. According to Section 4 of the first Freedmen's Bureau Act, this agency should have authority to set apart for use of local refugees and freedmen such tracts of land within the insurrectionary states that shall have been abandoned or to which the U.S. shall have acquired title by confiscation or sale or otherwise, and to every male citizen, whether refugee or freeman, as aforesaid, there should have been assigned not more than 40 acres of land. As has already been discussed, this was breached and violated by this country. In January 1865, General William Tecumseh Sherman had previously issued orders to General Rufus Saxton to divide land into 40-acre tracts and distribute them to freedmen after the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1985. Just two months later, after the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, President Andrew Johnson revoked the executive office support for the Freedmen's Bureau, reneged on the promises and commitments that had been negotiated mm -hmm. by abolitionist statesman Frederick Douglass in discussions with President Lincoln. Could the Those gentlelady, I, I, I beg her uh, yes. continuing apology to conclude. I will. Uh, because our time is, uh, going rapidly. Yes, sir. The Civil Rights Redress Act has already been addressed, which was passed in 1988. Uh, I have uh, submitted written testimony about the legal precedence that already has been set for reparations paid to others. It should be noted that reparations for Africans has not only been an issue cited by Africans in America, but also a significant point of discussion by Africans on the continent. We support in Detroit the passage of H.R. 40. And when it's passed, we urge that the study will give consideration for the current day equivalent of the dollars paid to an examination of what was paid to the persons who lost the Civil War. There should be consideration of what was paid to those who lost the Civil War. They received compensation and land. We ask that there be a special look at taxes, colleges, release of African Americans who have been political prisoners. We ask that there be a special look at the significance of health care, at the significant role of Africans who have preserved the United States as the United States. Most of our school children 
and many people in this room may not be aware that it is African descendants who have maintained this U.S. as the U.S. Mm -hmm. the, the North was losing until the engagement of Africans in the Civil War. We support immediate passage of H.R. 40. We thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your kind consideration well, and to this committee. We thank the Councilwoman. When we return, we'll hear from the American Bar Association President-elect, from the distinguished Winthrop Professor of History at Harvard University, and from the uh, Assistant Professor of Law at St. Louis University School of Law. We will stand in recess until we've uh, completed our vote on the floor.
to order. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Mr. Thomas Wells, Jr., partner of uh, Maynard, Cooper, and Gale in Birmingham, Alabama. He served as the ABA's policy-making House of Delegates since the year 1991 and was co-chair of the ABA's Special Committee on Disaster Response, which was commissioned after Hurricane Katrina. As this committee often looks to the ABA for guidance in advancing sound legal policy, we look forward to hearing from Mr. Wells on the issues uh, that bring us here today. He is, of course, the president-elect of the American Bar Association, and we give him congratulations in, in that area as well, and we'll incorporate his full testimony into the, the record at this point and invite him to make his testimony. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tommy Wells, and I'm a partner and a founding member of the law firm of Maynard Cooper and Gale in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm currently serving as the president-elect of the American Bar Association. Uh, as such, I will become the president of the ABA in August of 2008. I'm here today at the request of our current president, William Newcomb of Seattle, Washington, to present the views of the ABA. He sends his regrets that he was unable to attend this hearing. Mr. Chairman, the ABA supports the principle of H.R. 40, authorizing the establishment of a federally funded commission to study the impact of slavery on the social, political, and economic life of our nation. <clears throat> the objectives of H.R. 40 are consistent with ABA policy adopted in 2006 by our policymaking House of Delegates. We support the enactment of legislation to create and appropriate funds for a commission to study and make findings relating to the present day consequences of slavery and the subsequent denial of equal justice under law for persons of African descent living in the United States. More than four million Africans and their descendants were enslaved in the colonies that were to become the United States and later in the United States from 1619 to 1865. After the Civil War, the nation ratified three constitutional amendments espousing principles of equality and full citizenship for all Americans. But the post-Reconstruction era, marked by Jim Crow laws at the, local, at the local level, all the way up to the Supreme Court in its Plessy v. Ferguson decision, demonstrated how racism and racial bias could manipulate the justice system to undermine these constitutional principles and perpetuate widespread oppression. By the early part of the 20th century, there came to be two Americas, one that could rely on the rule of law and one that could not. Particularly egregious was the scourge of lynching. Lynch mobs murdered nearly 5,000 African-American men, women, and children and caused thousands more African-Americans to lose property, employment, and any means of support for their families. <clears throat> Through legally sanctioned, though legally sanctioned, racial discrimination crumbled in the past 50 years, concerns remain regarding the effect today on the social, political, and economic conditions for African Americans. As Justice Ginsburg stated in her concurring opinion in the 2003 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Grutter versus Bollinger, it is well documented that conscious and unconscious race bias, even rank discrimination based on race, remain alive in our land, impeding realization of our highest values and ideals. President George W. Bush stated in his Katrina speech in New Orleans, poverty has roots in a history of racial discrimination, which cut off generations from the opportunity of America. We have a duty to confront this poverty with bold action. I suggest, Mr. Chairman, that passage of H.R. 40 would be the bold action that President Bush was speaking of in September of 2005. In a major address to the American Bar Association in 2004, Justice Kennedy stated nationwide more than 40% of the prison population consists of African-American inmates. 
about 10% of African American men in their mid to late 20s are behind bars. In some cities, more than 50% of young African American men are under the supervision of the criminal justice system. The causes of these and other disparities require greater understanding if we are to address them with viable solutions. The question is not whether we need a commission like the one proposed in H.R. 40. The question is, why have we waited so long to establish one? Like the country as a whole, the ABA also has had a painful past. When our association was established almost 130 years ago, African Americans were denied membership. In fact, in 1925, the National Bar Association was formed by 100 black attorneys who had been denied ABA membership. We have, however, made strides to try to put our own house in order. We have created the ABA Center for Racial and Ethnic Diversity, which is empowered to make regular reports and recommendations to help guide the association. This continuing process is having positive effects on the diversity and inclusiveness, not only of our association, but of the more than 400,000 attorneys and legal professionals and the legal profession as a whole. In 2003, my friend, the Honorable Dennis Archer of Detroit, Michigan, became our first African-American president. I was honored to serve with President Archer as the chair of the ABA House of Delegates during his tenure as president of our association. President Archer was immediately followed in 2004 by our second African-American president, Robert Gray of Richmond, Virginia, another good friend of mine. In summary, Mr. Chair, I want to reiterate the American Bar Association's support in principle for H.R. 40. Thank you for the opportunity to convey the American Bar Association's views on this important topic. Thank you so much, and I'm, I'm glad you recall the, the uh, rather amazing phenomena of the uh, ABA having two consecutive African-American leaders of this distinguished legal organization. Uh, I appreciate your contribution and the continued relationship that this committee has with the American Bar Association. Professor Stephen Thernstrom is the Winthrop Professor of History at Harvard University. He recently co-authored with his wife uh, no Excuses, Closing the Racial Gap in Learning. The professor received his undergraduate degree from Northwestern University, his PhD from Harvard, and has been with this committee before we welcome him back again and look forward to hearing from him today. Y your statement will be included in its entirety in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, distinguished committee members for giving me the opportunity to appear. Um, I have filed written testimony and will not uh, try to rehash it here because a number of uh, uh, statements that have come to my attention since I wrote it uh, I think merit some comment. I will begin with uh, uh, a point I began with in that statement though which is that uh, I would disagree with Professor Miller, who said in his opening, his written statement, that uh, reparations is now in the mainstream of American discourse about race. Um, that probably is true in uh, rarefied academic precincts, but it certainly is not true among the general American public. And I cite as evidence the most recent poll I've seen, sponsored by the NAACP, so hardly hostile to this notion, which found that over 90% of whites, Latinos, and Asians in the United States were, in the words of the language of the NAACP's report, fervently opposed to the idea of paying money to African Americans whose ancestors were slaves. So even if the commission which is being proposed to study this matter 
issues a brilliantly persuasive report, I can say with great assurance that this will be an enormously controversial and divisive uh, measure. And I share my, uh, the views of my colleague Roger Clegg that it will not be a healing one. And indeed, if uh, reparations were to be confined to people who could prove descent from former slaves, it might be bitterly divisive within the African-American community, uh, dividing those who receive these benefits from those who do not. Second, I recognize this is only a proposal to study the matter, but a couple of observations about that. First, there is no topic that has been more intensively studied in the social sciences over the past 50 years than the condition of the African American population. There is an enormous literature, it continues to grow by leaps and bounds, uh, there continues to be great controversy, and I'm sure uh, the reigning views will modify as new research accumulates. So I find it very hard to think that a commission of seven people who could not possibly have mastered all of this voluminous literature will arrive at some meaningful consensus that will uh, alter public opinion um, to any great extent. And of course, I must be a little cynical here. The results of the commission will depend entirely on who is put upon it. Let re me remind you that the Dred Scott decision, which was referred to earlier today, was the work of a commission of sorts, a permanent commission called the Supreme Court of the United States. And yet it's, uh, the result of its deliberations does not, do not look very good uh, today. And if the composition of the commission were to mirror the composition of the witness list for this hearing, of course, the outcome is foregone. There is very little doubt that a large-scale reparations program would be recommended, provoking, I think, great public outcry. Now, as a historian, I have listened to the historical uh, comments uh, made in this hearing with interest and the historical material in the supporting documents, and I do find some uh, serious flaws in them that I think uh, one would have to consider in uh, making judgments about these matters. Uh, Ms. Taichimba, for, Taihimba, for example, uh, contends that the transatlantic slave trade was the beginning of a genocidal war against Africans. And this is a rather curious formulation in that, and likewise, that African Americans, uh, that Africans were kidnapped, I believe the chairman used that term today. Well, who did the kidnapping? Who captured them, marched them to port, and sold them to European slave traders? The answer is Africans, and the African governments of the parts of Africa in which the slave trade <laughs> occurred. So there is plenty of moral culpability to go around here, and it's hardly confined to Europeans. Then I wanted to mention some uh, remarks that appeared in the memo for the committee prepared by the Democratic staff, which refers to the federal government as, quote, the entity that sanctioned the slave trade and slavery for over 200 years. And I thought, 200 years, hmm, 1865, so that gets us back to 1665. What federal government do the authors of this document have in mind? Mm -hmm. Even in 1765, I would say we had no federal government in the United States. We were a colony of Great Britain with no representation I'm in I'm so Parliament. sorry to tell you your time has considerably expired, Professor. I thought I had five minutes, but. You did. Okay. But you, you can make a concluding thought if you choose. Uh, 
Well, I would simply say in conclusion that so much of the questioning today seemed to involve uh, issues of contemporary alleged discrimination, which certainly is well within the powers of Congress to deal with if there's discrimination in real estate uh, lending or automobile sales or whatever it is. There is an abundant literature, much of it produced by the federal government, every one of these things, and legislation to make that uh, anti-discrimination protection more effective. I would certainly welcome. Uh, that is a radically different thing than taking a whole sector of the population distinguished by race and saying, this is all the result of slavery and we're going to make up for it somehow. We could pass good legislation that protects all Americans from discrimination uh, without singling out African Americans as a special victim class. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our final witness is from St. Louis University Law School, Professor Eric Miller, who before joining the faculty there uh, was a fellow with the Harvard Criminal Justice Institute and the Harvard Civil Rights Project, as well as professor at Western New England College School of Law. He specializes uh, in historically significant race-based acts of violence, such as lynchings and riots. Not too long ago, we both had the opportunity to present at the Thomas Jefferson School of Law uh, in uh, California, let's see, was it San Diego, San Diego California, uh, uh, on a uh, discussion of this same subject. And we're very happy to welcome him here to the Judiciary Committee. And uh, uh, without objection, your full statement will be uh, recorded in the, uh, the uh, proceedings here, and you may be again. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, uh, my name is Eric Miller, and I'm an assistant professor of law at St. Louis University School of Law, and uh, I am honored by the committee's request that I testify at this very important hearing on the legacy of this transatlantic slave trade. I would like to begin by saying that um, I, I think uh, Professor Thernstrom's claim that the panel would come out a particular way is wrong because I don't actually quite know where I would necessarily come out on reparations. In fact, my work has been cited in dismissing a slavery uh, case uh, in the Northern District of California by Judge Nagel. So um, I don't know that that claim is, is totally accurate. In the short time available, I want to make the following um, five points. First, that there is still much about the history of slavery that remains to be discovered and talked about. Second, that the national government is ceding the initiative in acknowledging, accounting for, and acting upon that history to a variety of state and municipal governments and a variety of public and private institutions. Third, rather than adopting a confrontational posture, seeking to apportion blame or deny responsibility, we need to refine our national discussion of race. Fourth, the first stage of that process is now somewhat uncontroversial as most Americans acknowledge the invidious nature of slavery and segregation and its pernicious effects. But fifth, we require to progress to the next stages, including accurately accounting for that history and exploring its impact upon the present with an open mind, one that respects both historical fact and competing claims to community and equality of consideration in the membership of the American um, polity. Now, whether Professor Thernstrom likes it or not, reparations is part of the mainstream dialogue of America, although I acknowledge that large numbers of people don't like that. So, Wanda Sykes has discussed it on Fox TV, uh, Chris Rock on the HBO show, and there was a great discussion of reparations in the major motion picture Friday. So, people are, no, Barbershop. So, people are talking about it. But a major impediment in our national debate upon race is a purely confrontational model that, on the one side, tends to focus solely on establishing and seeking financial redress for some duty owed by whites to blacks for the wrong of slavery, and, on the other side, seeks to blame African Americans for the lingering effects of racism, or, in the words of Roger Clegg in the previous panel, um, claims that African Americans seek preferences or special treatments. 
That is echoing the majority opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson that African Americans seek to be the special favorites of the law. Rather than perpetuate this confrontational model, we must adopt a broader understanding of the types of harms inflicted by slavery and segregation. <clears throat> These harms are not singular, but plural, affecting a range of communities at different times and in different ways. Recent state-sponsored commissions uh, looking at slavery and segregation and studies by the universities of Alabama and North Carolina, as well as, as we heard in the last panel, by the Episcopal Church, have produced apologies for their ties to slavery. There have also, uh, and I think uh, Congressman Franks will be interested in this, uh, apologies from North Carolina, South Carolina, Orig Oregon, and Virginia for the eugenics programs that participated in the sterilization of African American women, uh, and many of, some of these programs running into the mid-1980s. The conversations stimulated by these initiatives invite a process of interrogating the basis of our shared community as Americans. We need to account for the ways in which the federal, state, and local governments have profited off or promoted slavery and segregation. These investigations seek to chart the ways in which national, state, and local communities have consolidated their civic identities in response to acts of racial violence both during and after the era of slavery. At a minimum, they seek to explore the effects that slavery and segregation played in establishing the relative social inequality of African Americans as compared to other racial or ethnic groups. To fail to acknowledge and account for America's history is to ignore and reject past and continuing experiences of a huge segment of the population. It is to perpetuate the treatment of African Americans as somehow less interesting or less worthy than other citizens. Justice Kennedy, in a last term Supreme Court case, parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District, recently suggested that an injury stemming from racial prejudice can hurt as much when the demeaning treatment based on race identity stems from bias massed deep within the social order as when it is imposed by law. Congressman Conyers' efforts to raise awareness of this issue and to promote the study of this issue through HR 40 are rightly celebrated. It is time that Congress joined the various states, municipalities, universities, and private organizations investigating the invidious uh, legacy of the slave trade so as to promote frank and open-minded discussions of the impact of slavery on race in America. The question is not whether to look forward. That is indeed, as the last panel suggested, an American talent. But every nation, including the most forward-looking, still reveres its past. The real question is whether we, as a nation, are to selectively consign a part of our shared history to the past, or whether to move forward as one nation, indivisible, under God. Thank you, Congressman. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mr. Miller. Good to see you again. Um, we, we had some questions, Professor Thurston, about your comment about a Democratic staff memo, uh, which it's, I, I wanted you to know I take exception to it and I'll, I'll be able to contact you about it. I don't want to spend my little five minutes parsing over that. Uh, and, and you said a chairman made some comment about kidnapping and I'm not sure if that, was that me you were referring to? Yes, I, if I, Understood correctly. Well, I, I take exception to that too, and uh, of course we got a stenographer here, so uh, we'll we'll clear all those kinds of questions up. Um, I, I'd like to ask, in the few minutes I have remaining, uh, uh, Councilwoman Watson, uh, this almost begins to sound like what the commission would be doing now. Everybody's telling me how much material is out there. Uh, it would take quite a, uh, I mean, this, this Judiciary Committee is, I think, the most active full committee in the Congress. Uh, we had legislation being reported on the floor today that I couldn't even uh, get to. We had two hearings, one is backed up right now. <laughs> And uh, this, is the way, this is the way our work week goes. We've we got a lot of work. There, there's a lot of people in the executive branch being examined. The Department of Justice is in shambles. Uh, it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, what, what 
What do you get out of this? And, and I thank you for coming. What, what do you get out of this today in terms of how we ought to be looking at how we might want to proceed? Because there's a, there's a, a feeling that uh, we're going to create more division by talking about this subject. I, I have never created division on the subject of race in my life. Uh, I mean, that's the, about the last thing I would like to do. And as one who's worked on race relations is about as much, uh, spent as much investment of my time as anybody else. Uh, uh, I, I think that we could go about this. I don't think the commissioners, and besides, I don't know what they're going to produce. I may end up not in agreement with their work product myself. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to predict where we're going. But at least the discussion, this discussion uh, is invaluable. It'll be the first time people are hearing it. So I, I, I want to ask you and the ABA president-elect uh, to give me a comment or two before the, the lights go off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your comments very much. And I agree with you in terms of the discussion. The discussion is rich and as one who's been actively involved in the in the movement for decades. I'm still learning and reading. My own research is uh, unfolding new information every day. I only found out two years ago that profits from the slave trade helped to finance the War of 1812, helped to uh, provide the basis for this country to double its size with the Louisiana Purchase. I just found that out two years ago that the money that uh, Thomas Jefferson used, Thomas Jefferson who wrote that all men are created equal, while well, being a person who thought he owned other persons, he was an enslaver. Uh, uh, but President Jefferson negotiated uh, the Louisiana Purchase with uh, revenue, federal revenue, that in part came from profits directly from the slave trade. And this is a matter of public record. So when one considers uh, all the information uh, that really needs to be unearthed for all Americans, it's not something that is just valuable to people of African descent. The whole country needs the, the, the shade to go up. All Americans need to know the full history of this country. Because the truth is we're one family, one human family, and it is, it is National Geographic, not the NAACP, not in COBRA. Uh, that said that all human life started on the continent of Africa. So if that's over all of African descent, all of us are God's children. So if we begin to see ourselves as one human family, then that takes us to another level. We, it gives us room uh, to move forward as one family uh, on behalf of the entire nation to bring forth new information, Mr. Pre Mr. Chairman. Could I yield to Trent Franks because I think we have a point of agreement here. And after all, that's what the hearings are about. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, as far as uh, all, all of us being one human family, is that the uh, point that you're asking me to address? Well, no, I, I just noticed you the, and I the, shaking yeah, our the head in, the, in I, I affirmation. I don't know which point we I agree with the, we gentle lady's, uh, the gentle lady's comment that we are all one human family and that uh, we have great value in considering our history and what, what mistakes we've made in the past and how we have wronged each other in the past so that we at least can prevent that from happening in the future. And that's something I agree. I may disagree with some of the conclusions that are, you know, the remedies here, but I do desperately agree with some of the foundations that are be la being laid here. Thank you. And uh, uh, President-elect of the bar, would you give, a, a, give me a closing comment, please? I'll be, I'll be glad to, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, one, uh, one question that, that comes up is what, what is the business of the Bar Association in taking a position on this issue? And I'll tell you what the, the reason for the position is the American Bar Association is vitally interested in the American justice system. We're vitally interested in the American criminal justice system. You have heard many statistics today indicating very clearly that disparities exist in our criminal justice system. The statement that I quoted from Justice Anthony Kennedy in his address to the American Bar Association in San Francisco, which led the ABA to set up what we call the Kennedy Commission. I was there. And 
the reason we support this is we need to know why there are those disparities. And one of the reasons may be the legacy of slavery and racial discrimination. If, in fact, that is one of the reasons for the disparities, then and only then can we begin to craft viable solutions to those disparities. So it is the business of American lawyers to make our justice system more just, and that is the reason we are here testifying today. Thank you. Trent Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this has been a very interesting um, discussion here, and I, I appreciate your forbearance that you have given me because I, I, I just want to say here at the outset, you know, you try to find the places of common ground that you have, and then I'll talk about some, maybe some of the differences. But um, I have no doubt that some of the difficulties today within the African American community, uh, there, there's no question in my mind that slavery uh, had a, a, a lasting systemic effect on that community. I have no doubt about that. Uh, that's really, in my judgment, though, not what is at issue. Uh, there's a lot of tragedies. My great-grandmother was, uh, was a Cherokee uh, Indian, and she uh, uh, you know, went through a lot of tragedies due to some of the policies that were uh, in place at that time. Um, but you know, my, my concern here is the remedy. The apology here, I, I think maybe an acknowledgment would be in order. I think maybe uh, some uh, way to gain from the, the failures of the past so that we can fix what we can in the future, because I think the only way we can truly honor those who were so desperately treated was to somehow make sure that their descendants are not treated the same way. Now, let me, if I can, um, I, I want to make a, I think that's probably my central point here today. Um, I believe that the tragedy of slavery was caused by a failure to recognize uh, what uh, Ms. Watson uh, said, and that was that we are all one human family, that uh, when we leave anyone out of that equation, that we step into a terrible nightmare. The reason that I have equated to a degree here slavery with abortion on demand and with the, the Holocaust in Germany is because I think they have a lot of things in common. In each case, they're closely associated with the Supreme Court decision. The High Tribunal of Germany said the Jew was not human. He was untermensch. The Supreme Court of the United States said the unborn child was not included in the word person in the Constitution. The Dred Scott decision said that the, the, the black man was not a person under the Constitution. In every one of those cases, uh, it perpetuated or, or instigated a great tragedy that cost millions of lives. And the response to that was also a commonality. In every case, there was a world war or, or a civil war, and I don't know what will happen in the future related to abortion on demand but the commonality is unavoidable. Now, I, I think that the point here is that we must not be guilty of making the mistakes of our predecessors. What possessed them in retrospect to hold a black man, not a person, is beyond me. What possessed the, the, the intelligentsia of Germany to hold the Jews, not a person, is beyond me. What possesses us today to hold a child, not a person, is beyond me. I um, would res respond to Mr. Cohen's, I wish he were here. He said, well, the difference is that one's a choice. But I remind him that in the discussions between Abraham Lincoln and Justice, uh, Judge Douglas, uh, Judge Douglas made the argument, he said, well, I'm not pro-slavery. I, I, I just want people to have that right. There was a play many years ago where Justice Taney, who was a Supreme Court justice under Abraham Lincoln, um, one of the players probably quoted him in a probably a, uh, pretty artistic license, but he said this. I remembered the quote. He said, the abolitionist doesn't understand one thing. Slavery is not compulsory. If he has some moral dilemma with owning slaves, we suggest, therefore, that he not own them. But he should not impose his morality upon those of us who do or otherwise interfere with our right to choose. Now, that could be yesterday's headline. It's a false argument because the little boy next to the mom said, well, what's, what's wrong with that statement? He said, he said, well, mommy, the slave's a human being. It's astonishing to me how God gives children the insight to see the obvious, but withholds it from Supreme Court justices sometimes. Could the gentleman yield for one Certainly. second? Uh, how about racism being a reason for slavery? Well, I absolutely believe that racism was a, a reason for slavery, but racism is saying to the person, because of the color of their skin, that you're not fully equal to me. That's racism. That's what it is. Absolutely, right. the gentleman's correct. Absolutely, the gentleman's correct. And I would just say to you, let me shift gears here. 
One of the reasons I keep talking about this issue is that 14% of childbearing women today uh, are, are black, but yet they, they account for 31% of abortions. For every three black children that are born, two are aborted. I find that to be a moral outrage beyond my ability to, to articulate here today. If there is anything that is an attack on the African community, American community, it has got to be that. There were four million slaves, and yet since Roe versus Wade, 10 million unborn children that were African American or black children, 10 million of them have been killed before they were born. They didn't get a chance to even be enslaved because they were killed before they ever saw the light of day. And well, I find would that the, to be, Would the again, gentleman yield just for one moment? Yes, sir. There, there were uh, women on the, the slave ships that threw their children overboard uh, I, I rather agree, Mr. than let them, let, let them ever grow up. Uh, I agree. You're, the chairman is exactly correct. Uh, adults let, under slavery. Let me, I, that, that's I, a I agree. That I, I can't, but it was still I, I a wrong choice, and it's I, still a choice that shouldn't be illegal. It shouldn't be legal in a country that upholds the value of innocent human life. And so let me just close up. One of the things that happened, you know, in each of these cases, the country was divided. But one thing that happened in this country, as much as our government was responsible for allowing slavery, Mr. Chairman, we finally came to ourselves and we said we're not going to do it anymore. And the government, this government also changed that. And that's one of the reasons I think America is set apart. But we forget maybe why. A lady by the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. She said she had a dream about a slave that was being beaten by his masters, beating, beating him to death. And he was praying for them as he was being beaten to death. And that story caused her to write this book that touched the conscience of America. And we ended this horrifying practice that has uh, still, still is a crushing mark on America's history. And I'm just saying to you that I pray that somehow Today, we can come to the same conclusion that we don't have to make the past mistakes again. Let's get together and let's say whatever it was, whether it was slavery, whether it was abortion on demand, whether it was um, attacking people because they're Irish ancestry, whatever it was, when we dehumanize another person, especially in the law, this society, this generation, this human family must stand up and change that so that we don't perpetuate the tragedies of the past. I, I Mr. Thank, Chairman, I, I yield back. I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, th does any of the, uh, I, Miller, Mr. Miller, Attorney Miller, Ms. Watson, uh, briefly your comments? Um, and then we uh, turn to the, ge the gentleman from Minnesota for the final uh, interrogation. <laughs> thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to respond. Can I um, just say uh, how heartened I am to hear the uh, engagement in this, uh, the passionate engagement in this discussion um, by Congressman Franks and the terms in which he engages in this discussion, I, I think um, that's a deeply heartening um, development. Um, one point uh, that is worth making is um, that many African American women weren't even given the right to choose whether to abort or not abort because of laws enforcing sterilization so that many African-American women, just by virtue of going to hospital to get an, an operation, were given forced hysterectomies. Um, and uh, that is a history that does go back through the eugenics movement into um, slavery where the science of gynecology was developed in Alabama, actually. There's a little plaque on the wall of a building in Montgomery, Alabama um, through practicing on slaves. So uh, that is a, a relatively um, direct uh, link. So to the extent that um, uh, Congressman Franks has suggested that uh, it is worth acknowledging that history, I'm deeply heartened. And to the extent that uh, this committee is point drawing out the commonalities in the discussion um, across party lines and across philosophical lines, I find that deeply heartening and commend uh, the committee. Councilwoman Watson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say that as a person who's been involved in multiple movements for a long time, I'm very active in the women's movement, peace movement, et cetera. Uh, so I've had a lot of discussion uh, and have been in the business of uh, talking about pro and con on abortions, immigration, the crack cocaine disparity, gay marriages, et cetera. Uh, but on the issue of, of, of the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade, 
And given that 246 years of Africans working, being lynched, tortured, drawn and quartered, uh, African women having babies cut out of their stomachs and having no one to appeal on their behalf, being killed if they dare to uh, read and write when it was against the law for Africans to read and write during that period. Given the wealth of this country, they got built off the backs, including the U.S. Capitol, got built by Africans who never got paid. It didn't just benefit the enslavers. In the South, the entire nation benefited. Uh, this deserves uh, a special discussion and review and commission without uh, being forced to uh, share the podium with another equally uh, passionate issue for some. There has not been a hearing before the U.S. Congress on the issue of reparations and the crime against humanity. There was a transatlantic slave trade as declared by the United Nations World Conference Against Racism in 2001 before today. So I, I, I just want to say for the record, I'm going to stay centered on yeah. the significance uh, of this uh, without uh, passing any uh, aspersion on other issues. This deserves a focal point because this was the purpose of today's hearing. And I thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Well, this is a hearing on whether we should have a study that would, would come before a, an examination of reparations. Because we don't, we don't know where the study is going to go and uh, presumably it would gather the uh, large amount of evidence that is already out there, which uh, we 30 some odd men and women are, aren't in any position to try to gather and pull together. And the thought was that it would be more efficiently done uh, if uh, for the whole Congress, if we had somebody do it for us. And uh, it's no more complicated or simple than that. And I thank the gentlelady, recognize Keith Ellison for as the final member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Professor Thurnstrom, thank you for your presentation. I want to thank all the panel members. I think you and Mr. Clegg in the earlier panel pointed out that there, are, there have been a number of studies out there on various aspects of uh, African American life and history. Could you identify for me, because I'm very interested in reading it, could you identify for me the, the study uh, that has been issued by uh, a government commission, a federal government commission, that explored the um, transatlantic slave trade and its impact on modern African American life. If you could just cite that study for me, maybe we don't need to do any of this. Could you do that for me, please? Well, Congressman, uh, I would say there is no such study by the federal okay, th government. Okay, thank you, and thank you. That, I, I, have, I don't see how one could. I do have to reclaim my time. Thank you, Professor Thernstrom. And I also want to thank you for your very direct question because a direct answer because we could go, you know, people sometimes filibuster. So I do thank you for your direct answer. There's no such study out there. And I think that kind of makes the case for me. Um, let me ask you this also, uh, Professor Thernstrom. Um, you've you've uh, identified one of the potential harms of such a uh, a, a, a commission and study as it could be divisive. Did, have you found that the, uh, the, the, the exploration and subsequent uh, payment of even reparations, which this bill doesn't even ask for, it's just a study bill, but the study and subsequent payment of reparations to Japanese Americans has alienated them from American society? Well, no, I think there are great differences. Okay, in thank you. The uh, thank you, sir. Well, what about, um, I think there have been other communities that receive reparations around the world. Uh, uh, Ms. Watson, have, have the studies, have, have the other cases in which reparations has actually, reparations have actually been found to be due and owing and paid, of course, this bill doesn't go that far, right? Have they alienated those communities which have received reparations? And why, why confine ourselves to America? I know that Germany paid reparations, rep, reparations to, uh, to, to Jews, and uh, there have been other uh, reparatory provisions around the world as a result of conflict between peoples. Have this, has these heightened disputes between people, or, or what has been the effect? Mr. Chair, uh, the record includes uh, 25 million 
paid by Austria to Jewish Holocaust survivors. Uh, we know about the $20,000 each to Japanese Americans and a letter of apology. The United States gave $1 billion for plus four, 44 million acres of land to honor the Alaska Native's land settlement in 1952. Germany paid $82.2 million to Jewish Holocaust survivors in the German Jewish settlement. The Ottawa's of Michigan in 1985 received $105 million. Uh, the Sioux of South Dakota received the same. In 1980, the United States gave $81 million to the Klamaths of Oregon. And there's a long list. Have, have the p those um, payments worked to further alienate those uh, recipients from American society? Have they, I mean, uh, are we now, I mean, have, I guess to answer your question, I guess you, you're saying no, right? But, but I guess, you know, there, have, there is precedent but, my, but I think there's concern that this is somehow going to harm America because digging up all this old stuff is, is just going to make us less, uh, less interested in, in being, you know, a part of America. Well, some of the largest reparations aren't called reparations. The Homestead Act was reparations for white male property owners. And, and See, I, so that's that part they, of what the study would need to unearth. Are they uh, alienated from the mainstream of American society? White males? I don't yeah. think so. They're doing okay? Mr. Miller, what do you think about this question of, sep of dividing America by exploring reparations? Is, is it really, does that carry any water with you that looking into this issue is going to somehow fracture our country? Uh, it depends how it's done. If it's done responsibly, the answer is no. I think there's been a, um, a drawing of battle lines around the concept of, re uh, around a misconception of what reparations might be about. And uh, what part of my scholarship is doing and what the work of, of uh, some of the other panelists has been is to get us past that toxic he said, she said style of debate and instead develop a more inclusive debate that um, points to people like Congressman King's uh, grandfather or interrogates what is the role of John Brown in American history and you know, honors everybody in the in the discussion, rather than prejudging what the outcome is going to be in terms of, uh, you know, even whether there ought to be a payment, should it be education or whatever. Right. I'd just like to point this out if I have any more time. Um, you know, earlier this year, uh, a fairly uh, controversial bill came up about just whether or not the U.S. Congress would would find that the that, that somehow the, the 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 Armenian people were the target of genocide. Uh, in uh, the precursor country to Turkey, which would have been the Ottoman Empire. It's a very controversial issue. And uh, without going into what the final outcome would or should could be, because of course we never had that vote, some people said, well, you know, it would harm Turkey to have this discussion. But one Turkish person said to me, he said, it wouldn't harm us to find that our ancestors had done some things that we're not proud of. That's just a human condition. But it, what harms us is just not really facing it and acknowledging it and dealing with those harms. Uh, and you, we might find very well that there were some members of the Turkish community who would behave very admirably. And we may find that there might have been some people in the Armenian community that, that, that did some things we're not too proud of either. It's really not a blame shame thing. It really is about coming to grips with our own history and understanding that slavery is not something that happened to black people. It's something that happened to all of Americans, everybody. And we all, in one way or another, I even read some stories about African Americans who owned slaves in America. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and it, you know, Mr. Thurs, Professor Thurston's point about finding if we explored this subject, we might find that Africans themselves were implicated in the slave trade. I don't think that should stop us at all from going forward. They very well were likely to be involved, and I'm sure the study would confirm your suspicion that, they, that some were. But I think that it, there, is, there is a tremendous value in exploring in a nation dedicated to freedom and justice and equality, this state of unfreedom and anti-freedom that existed for so many years among us. So this you. has been such a tremendous uh, initial conversation. It's historic. I thank uh, Congressman Franks, Congressman Ellison, who stood, been with me all morning, and all of you who've been here uh, Councilwoman Watson, President Wells, Professor Thernstrom, Attorney Miller, uh, you have our 
dedicated uh, appreciation of us beginning this conversation. I, I think we're going to examine each other's positions, and I think we're going to be moving forward uh, in, in a way that will create a history that will make us proud of, of what we're attempting to do here. I, I've appreciated the interchanges, and this is how things happen, or ought to happen in the Congress. They don't always happen <laughs> this way, or nor in the courts, as has been pointed out more than once. I thank you all, and the uh, committee thank is you, adjourned. Mr.